Hello, Hello, all. Welcome to the seminar. Today's speakers are Dr. Hilal Lashwal uh, and um, Anton Loke. First speaker is uh, Dr. Lashwal. He received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from City University of New York and completed his PhD degree at Texas A&M and the Scripps Research Institute. He then joined the Picover Institute for Medical Research in Long Island of New York and then moved to Harvard Medical School as a research fellow. In 2005, Dr. Larshwal moved to Switzerland to join the Brain Mind Institute at EPFL, where he is a faculty of neuroscience and the director of laboratory of molecular and chemical biology of neurodegeneration. Dr. Larshwal's research focuses on applying chemical biology approaches to elucidate the mechanisms of protein folding, misfolding, and aggregation and their contribution to neurodegenerative diseases. With that brief introduction, I would like to welcome um, Hilal Lashwal to give his talk. Get started, Hilal. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you very much again for the kind invitation and the opportunity to be here and share with you some of our work. Today, I would try to focus my talk mainly on our work on Huntington and some of the recent studies in our lab that is sort of a forcing us to do two things. One is to rethink our understanding of mechanisms of protein aggregation and toxicity in Huntington disease. And the second one, uh, in the need to develop new strategies and model systems to bridge the gap between our detailed molecular understanding of mechanisms of protein aggregation in cell-free system and the complexity of these processes in, uh, in how they occur in the brain and cellular system. So I'd like to start simply by introducing people to Huntington disease and those people who do not know about Huntington, it's a neurodegenerative disorder that is caused by death of neurons in the brain. This usually manifests to a complex of set of both motor, behavioral and cognitive symptoms. The most obvious of which is the motor system symptoms that one usually sees in Huntington Huntington's patients, which have to do with difficulty in controlling movement. This is a video of our colleagues, Chris Ross, who's our neurologist, seeing one of the Huntington patients. I just want us to start by emphasizing that Huntington, again, is not a disease about motor symptoms. It has many motor, behavioral, and cognitive functions also. This is the main sort of the feature that the disease manifests itself and the obvious one that we see. In the case of Huntington, we actually know the cause of the disease. It's caused by mutation in the Huntington gene in chromosome four. And it has to do in the normal individuals who have this gene. With the, in, in the normal individuals, uh, there is a polyglutamine repeat and exon one of this gene that is usually less than 35 repeats. In individuals with Huntington disease, the mutation leads to an expanded version of this poly-Q tract, usually with poly-Q repeats in above 34, 36 to 40. And at the pathological level, the disease is characterized, as we mentioned before, by the loss of dopamine, by the loss of neurons, brain atrophy, and the presence of proteinaceous sort of both nuclear and cytoplasmic aggregates in, in neurons in the brain. So it turns out that in Huntington, the size does matter. The length of the poly-Q repeat correlates very well with disease onset and disease severity. Individuals with less than 26 usually don't have the disease and next generation are unlikely to have the disease. If you have between 27 to 35 poly-Q repeats, then individual may not have the disease, but there is a possibility that the second generation could have the disease. And those between 36 to 39 are very high likely to get the disease. And the longer the repeat, as we said earlier, the more severe the disease and the earlier the onset. So it's a disease for which we know the cause and it is a disease which is easily diagnosed by a blood test and doing a sort of a DNA test to diagnose it. So we, we know quite a lot about the Huntington pathology. We know that, as I mentioned, that these neurons have accumulation of, intra, of nuclear and cytoplasmic inclusions, although the correlation between inclusion formation and degeneration is not so straightforward. We know that these cytoplasmic and nuclear inclusions are 
made of a number of Huntington proteins. So they're not made of a single Huntington protein. Biochemical analysis of these, pro of these inclusions reveal that the presence of full-length Huntington, but also a number of Huntington fragments. Which of these fragments is actually responsible for triggering this process of pathology formation is not yet clear. Some of the uh, missing links that are sort of hindering our progress toward developing diagnostics and therapies for Huntington include the fact that, as we said, you know, the mechanism by which this process of aggregation and inclusion formation contributes to degeneration remains unknown. The mechanism of toxicity or the link between protein aggregation and toxicity is not so clear. And the nature of the toxic species or toxic form of Huntington is yet to be identified. We also know very little about the ultrastructure and biochemical composition of these inclusions and what that might in, you know, implications for this uh, for the disease. Therefore, understanding or sort of addressing these missing link is critical not only for understanding the mechanisms of uh, underlying pathology of Huntington, but also for developing therapies that prevent these pathogenic processes associated with the disease. And understand, and, and this is also understanding these mechanisms and the nature of form of Huntington that is actually responsible for initiation and formation of this pathology is also essential for developing the right relevant animal and cellular models to study this disease. So in today's talk, I would like to, to uh, talk about two main things, which is our recent studies from our lab so aimed at trying to understand which forms of Huntington are actually responsible for uh, inclusion formation. Is there a single form, multiple form, and does it matter? What are the implications of this? In the second part of the talk, I will highlight some of recent new insight from correlative light electron microscopy and proteomic studies that we have done aimed at dissecting the mechanism of Huntington formation and in in inclusion formation in cells. I had initially intended to talk about some of our recent work on trying to determine the cryo EM structure of uh, Huntington fibrils, but Time is limited. I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end, or you can see uh, our recent paper on this work uh, published in JAX. Most of the work that I will be talk to, talking about has uh, been summarized in these publications, with the exception of the first part on Poland Huntington, which has not been published. So Huntington is a big protein. It's 356 kilodalton protein. And for Decades, people have been trying to determine the structure of Huntington without any success, mainly because in, in its own, Huntington is a very flexible protein that adopts many conformations, and one can see this in electron microscopy. So initial studies attempts to determine the three-dimensional structure of Huntington were not successful until people found out that when Huntington is bound to another Huntington associated protein HAP40, the protein becomes stable. And this was a nice trick to stabilize the protein and determine its three-dimensional structure. And this is by cryo-EM, this is the structure of the Huntington protein, the complex to HAP40. So we've known before the structure was solved for years that simple sequence changes, modification within the small N-terminal part of this protein called exon one which constitute only 3% of the size of the protein, were sufficient to reverse Huntington-associated pathology and degeneration. Or either increase it in the case of the poly, increasing the poly Q repeat length in Huntington was shown to increase inclusion formation and, and, and degeneration. Whereas post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation at serine 13 and S16 in this small part of the First 17 amino acids was also shown to be sufficient to protect against Huntington aggregation and toxicity in animal models expressing the full length protein. Subsequent studies from our lab and others also showed that PTMs in this region are actually protective in different models of Huntington aggregation and degeneration. So the question we've had for years is, you know, we know this, but what we didn't know is do these changes in this small part of the protein exert their effect at the level of the full length protein, 
or only in the poly Q containing small fragments of the protein. And this has not been addressed uh, for decades. When the cryogenic structure is solved, we were very excited we saw, because we thought we will find the answers from the cryogenic structure in the context of how do modifications in this region influence the structure of the protein and its behavior. But it turns out that in the structure, this region is flexible and missing. So shown here is the cryogenic structure of Huntington and the gray areas reflect part of the protein that sort of represent loops or flexible domains. So, we did not learn very much from the cryogenic structure about how this region influenced the protein. It was thought then basically maybe if you solve the cryogenic structures of the Huntington with different polyglutamine length, we may be able to gain some insight. Unfortunately, the cryogenic structure of Huntington with poly-Q length expansion of different lengths seems to be virtually identical. This is the cryogenic structure of Huntington 70Q uh, complex to HAP40, 4060Q, and 128Q. When we overlay them, you see a very identical structure suggesting so that domain remained flexible. Uh, so what we set out in the lab first to determine is to answer the question, can, does the full length protein aggregate on its own? And it, it, we, this work was initiated by Dries, a technician in the lab, and followed by a PhD student, Enzo Moro. So what we did in this context is we generated full-length Huntington protein with poly-Q length, a repeat of different length, 23Q, 48Q, and 73, so both below and above the pathogenic threshold. And when we looked at the stability of this protein and their propensity to aggregate, we looked up to four weeks of incubation at 37 degrees. The protein does not form any fibrils. We looked at uh, you know, increasing the concentration of these proteins. We get no fibril formation at all. After three weeks, we see that this, this is the native Huntington began to form small clubs of not clumps of non-fibrillar aggregates because the monomeric protein is 350 kilodalton. These aggregates can actually be sedimented. But in all the conditions, including exploring different pHs, we could not find that Huntington full-length protein could make fibrillar aggregates in vitro. And what we know that for most proteins like TDP43, for example, it has the globular domains and it has a low complexity domains which can drive the aggregation of the full length. We know if you take A beta and attach it to GFP, you can still form fibrils, the same for tau. But this doesn't, this aggregation domain, the interminus of Huntington seems to be not sufficient to drive the fibrillization of the full length. And we argue that because of the large size of the protein, there is quite a bit of structural hindrance to form a very tightly packed uh, amyloid fibers. But what we know is, is also, if we look at the effect of these sequence changes at the level of the exon one fragment itself, then they do predict the aggregation properties and the toxicity of this protein in cells. We know that if we take exon one by itself, either in vitro or cells, the longer the poly Q, the higher the propensity of the protein to aggregate. In our lab, we have looked at the effect of all the known PTM modification within N17. And usually the effect of these PTMs is that we see in vitro is predictive of the behavior of the protein in cells. So for example, we know that phosphorylation at T3 and phosphorylation at S13 inhibit aggregation. And we can show that you know, kinases that phosphorylate at these residues also inhibit aggregation cells. So this led us to suggest that perhaps the effect of these of the poly-Q expansion and these, these uh, PTMs in the N17 is mediated primarily on the fragment form of the protein and not the full length form of the protein. So to summarize this part, what I've shown you is that the full length protein does not form fibrillar aggregates. The effect of some PTMs and poly-Q expansion at the level of exon one predict their effect on Huntington aggregation and toxicity in vivo. And this led us to hypothesize that Proteolytic processing of the full length Huntington may be required for Huntington aggregation and inclusion formation. To begin to test this hypothesis, one needs to first 
identify which are the natural fragments that are normally generated by Huntington protein in cells, and then which enzymes are usually are responsible for this. Unfortunately, right now, we don't know the exact answers for this, but what we did to test this hypothesis is to try to explore, you know, uh, 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 enzymes or proteases that can give, give us rise to fragments that are similar to those seen in vivo. So for many years, exon one, as many one as many of you know, has been this uh, fragment is the most studied fragments, simply because there is strong evidence that this fragment actually occurs by naturally through alternative uh, parent uh, splicing, and that it also contains this poly Q repeat. And it's present in disease brain and in animal models, it seems to be sufficient to reproduce many key features of the disease. In the context of in vitro studies, because of the small size of this protein and because people developed initially efficient expression system using GST efficient proteins and others, it became the most dominantly and mainly studied fragment of Huntington. But we know, as I said, that Huntington undergoes proteolysis, and these are some of the fragments of Huntington that have been actually shown to occur in vivo. And our hypothesis is that Huntington processing here could be result in the generation of these fragments, and these fragments are likely to be the main drivers of Huntington aggregation. So to test this, you know, no one has looked at whether you can induce Huntington the generation of exon 1 from the full length protein and the generation of exon 1 fibers. And in our lab, we're basically testing these two hypotheses. One is that is proreolysis and generation of different internal fragments is, is a key step for formation of pathology. And the second one, which I'm not going to talk about today, is that post translational modification play a key role in regulating susceptibility of Huntington to hydrolysis. So what Enzo in the lab did is basically we went and we tried to identify proteases that cut, cut, cut the full length Huntington protein without any cleavages within exon one. And also if they cut outside exon one is okay. And what we found here is the criteria was it does not cleave within exon one and that exon one could result in production of interminal fragment of diff different length. And we found one of these proteases, which is RC, which cleaves right just after exon one. It also leads the production of a number of fragments at 128 and 167, which are similar to Huntington fragments that have been observed in vivo. And therefore, we asked the question, if we take full length Huntington protein, treat it with this enzyme, it will generate these fragments. And then we asked, is this be sufficient? Will we get aggregation of these fragments? And which fragments will lead to the formation of Huntington fibers? This is just an experiment using a wild type full length Huntington where you can monitor the cleavage of Huntington bar RC over time. And what you could see is that quickly within the first hour, we see the generation of a number of fragments that becomes later dominated by these interminal fragments and you see the gradual uh, buildup of exon one after one hour. And these fragments decrease over time. So what, when you monitor this reaction by electron microscopy, this is what you see. Of course, in the beginning, you have a mixture of different fragments. So at early on, you don't have the generation of uh, these interminal fragments. You have mostly globular structures. At time four hour, where you have a mixture of both in-terminal fragment and exon one, we began to see this non-fibrillar aggregate, we believe are composed of longer in-terminal fragments. And if you wait longer after exon one is formed then wait 24 hours, when, then you can find the formation of fibrils. This is the first time that exon one fibrils are generated through processing of the full length Huntington protein. Therefore, we can, we can establish this proreolysis as a potential mechanism for generation of Huntington aggregates. Now, as I mentioned, there are a num different number of fragments that have been observed for Huntington in vivo, but the aggregation properties of these fragments have not been investigated because they're very difficult to express and purify and handle. So Dries, uh, Raja, and Iman in the lab set out to explore the mechanism of aggregation of these different fragments in vitro. Uh, 
And I'm here summarizing, summarizing this result. This work is summarized, is presented this uh, Jack's paper we published last year. And what you could see is that when you have exon one of the Huntington protein, it aggregates very rapidly in vitro and forms mainly these single short fibrillar structures. If we go to a longer fragment of Huntington, we extend this by about 15 residues to Huntington 104. It does not affect it slow, the, dramatically the kinetics or the morphology of Huntington aggregate. Now, if you start to go to longer fragments, you know, 140 or 171, where you have this, you know, part of a globular helical uh, repeat domain, now we see a dramatic change in, in the type of aggregates that are formed. We see instead of these five single filament, we see these bundles of aggregates that tend to pack together. So what Raja and Iman did is they set out to dissect the mechanism of how these large aggregates form. And what they showed basically is that at very early time point, these longer interminal fragment Huntington 71 is self-assemble into these globular structures and then goes on to form these very diffuse structures where you can see the proteins are beginning even to line up to form fibrils, but they don't form smooth fibrils. However, over time, what you see is that emanating from these sort of amorphous type of uh, or less ordered structures are fibrils that emerge and grow sort of on the surface of these aggregates, which then have a very high tendency to self-associate. And when we try to understand the mechanism of this, we believe that this initial part could be driven by sort of a phase separation related event. And the mechanism we, you know, the model we proposed in the case of the longer fragment, that the aggregation is actually driven by this globular domain and not by this poly-Q or N, N, N17 domain. And this leads to the clustering of Huntington, which then, then the poly-Q and NC17 undergo conformational change and begin to self-assemble at the end of these giving to these emanating fibril structures. So the idea here is that this process is initiated by the globular domain rather than the poly-Q domain. And what is nice is that Iman has done some cryo-electron microscopy. And when you look at the fibrils under cryo condition formed by this 171, you can see nicely the filament here decorated by this individual globular domain representing this helical repeat uh, domain uh, that we see there. And these are some more close uh, close up images of this protein. Now, we had previously described that in this region of 128 to 138 is a very highly amylogenic sequence that induces the aggregation of Huntington's in, in addition to the poly Q. So we reasoned if this is really the mechanism of driving aggregation, then removing this hydrophobic domain should prevent the clumping or this lateral association of these aggregates or disfavor this aggregation mechanism. And in here you see, this is a exon 171 with 128 to 138 removed. And you can see we began now to go back to forming these individual filaments. The second experiment to test this hypothesis was if we add simply this globular domain of 105 to 171, we should be able to compete for these interactions and prevent the aggregation of this protein. And what you see here is a dose-dependent inhibition of the aggregation of 171 by this globular domain 105 to 171. So establishing that this mechanism for these longer repeat is, is likely holds. Now we tried to look at the aggregation of other longer repeat 5AD6, for example, and when we study these different fragments in cell, we could never in our hand get this 5AD6 uh, larger interminal fragment to form inclusions, especially nuclear inclusions and in neurons. And we tried to look at this, so we expressed the protein in vitro, we studied its aggregation at different pHs, at different incubation, 37 degrees, we could never get the protein to aggregate. It turns out that if we play with the phosphorylation state of this protein by inducing hyperphosphorylation at three to four sites that the protein can begin to aggregate. And so now we can be, see the formation of these protofilaments and fibro-like structures. And in some conditions, we can see the formation of these single and twisted helical filament by this full length protein. So why I'm saying this is I, you know, to, to, to summarize this part, what I'm trying to show you here is that 
the mechanism that can not only the kinetics of aggregation is different for the different fragments, but also the mechanism of aggregation is different. Which part of the protein is responsible for initiating the process is dependent on the in terminal length. And for example, in the case of exon one, we have you know two different Mac proposed models now. One where aggregation is driven by N17 or the aggregation of the poly-Q domain. Whereas I've shown you in the case of longer repeat, this process could be initiated by this globular domain to, ink, to bring all these exon one into place and then fiber formation could be initiated on the surface of these aggregates. I've also shown you that in the case of the 586 fragment, the aggregation is initiated by a post-translational modification of the protein. So to summarize this part, what I hope I've been able to convince you is that the sequence outside the poly-Q domain could play an important role, not only in the initiation of aggregation, but also in determining the aggregation pathway and the final, final morphological and structural properties of the aggregates. The different N-terminal aggregates could have distinct aggregation mechanisms, and that the single poly, what this means is that a single poly-Q targeting anti-aggregation strategies may not be effective to inhibit the aggregation of different fragments. And that if we want to target Huntington aggregation in vivo, then we will need to take into consideration the presence of multiple fragments and perhaps future screens should include multiple fragments, be done against multiple four fragments of Huntington, not one. And, and, and finally, we still don't understand when these different fragments that form, how do they interact with each other and influence the mechanism of Huntington aggregation. Now I'd like in the last few minutes to, to talk about our effort to try to understand how Huntington aggregates form in cells. And you know, we know from the ultrastructure studies of Huntington aggregates that they look like these. And what you could see here is that there is the Huntington aggregates that appear to be fibrillar, but they're surrounded by different cellular you know, sort of structures such as mitochondria, organelles, and lipids. And so our goal is, you know, in, in vitro, this is what Huntington aggregates look like. You know, as I showed you, they're mostly fibrillar. This is what Huntington aggregates look in the brain. And what we're trying to do is to figure out a way where we can develop model systems that reconstitute the complexity of Huntington aggregates in the brain. And that's the idea of trying to develop cellular model to do this. So to do this, what we did in the lab is we studied, tried to study the mechanism of Huntington aggregation. As I said, Huntington aggregates form in the cytosol and the nuclear. We, so to do this, we use different model systems. We use hex cells because overexpression of Huntington and hex cells result in predominantly cytoplasmic inclusion. So it was, we can use it to study both cytoplasmic and nuclear. In neuronal cells, the overexpression of Huntington results predominantly in nuclear inclusion. And some of you may be familiar of this work that we have done in our lab in the case of Parkinson's disease, where we have recently developed and published a model where we can re reproduce the complexity in Lewy bodies in the brain in primary neurons. And what we use here to characterize this is a technique known as correlated electron microscopy. So we use condition to introduce synuclein aggregation in neurons. We monitor how these aggregates evolve over time. And then we use cryo electron, sorry, electron microscopy to see how the, these aggregates actually evolve over time and how they interact with other cellular components and lead to inclusion. So we extended the same approach to look at Huntington. And in, in hex cells, if you overexpress Huntington, in this case, we're working with exon one. And I would like to emphasize here that we're working with exon one in the absence of a GFP tag. And I'll emphasize why that's important later. When you overexpress Huntington one in cells, you see always the formation of these ring-like structures. And we tried every, although everyone has reported it, nobody understood why we have these ring-like structures. We tried different antibodies and irrespective of the antibody, we get the same ring-like structure. And this led us to suggest that either these aggregates are so compact that the antibodies cannot get into the middle or that there is something else in the middle and Huntington is mainly organized in the periphery. 
Now, when we look by electron microscopy, and this is all work led by Neta Reguin, a PhD student in the lab, now we can see the detailed ultrastructure features of these Huntington inclusions. And what you can see is that they are not simply made of aggregates. The center of these Huntington inclusion we show are made of dense accumulation of fibrils in complex with lipids, as well as ER membranes. And at the edge, you can see radiating filaments of hunting fibrils. So this ultrastructure organization clearly explains this sort of immunohistic chemistry pattern we see in cells. So then we basically, you can see this is a 3D reconstruction of these inclusions that allows you to see how do these aggregates interact with the cellular compartments around them. And you can see that the formation of these aggregates are surrounded by these ER structures. So there is an, an mitochondria in the vicinity. And so these inclusions are not only made of fibrils. There is hundreds and hundreds of proteins that are there representing different cellular pathways and cellular compartments that are there. So this shows that similar to what we see in Parkinson, the process of inclusion formation is distinct from that of aggregation. So there is Huntington aggregation, then Huntington inclusion formation, which appears to be a much more complex pathway. We tried to do functional studies to see how these inclusions influence the cellular function. We did see an increase in ER exit site remodeling, which suggests that this process could contribute to ER Golgi secretory defect. We, in the case of mitochondrial function, we see an increase in mitochondria fragmentation and mitochondria respiration, which we believe represent an adaptive record mechanism to, to generate sufficient energy to cope with this unfolding response. In the case of these hex cells, we actually don't see quite a lot of cell death. So the formation of this inclusion may either degenerate, you know, cell death take long time, or that they could actually, you know, constitute an adaptive response. We tried to look at the effect of the polycule length and the ultrastructure properties of the inclusions, and we do see a big effect. You see, this is a 39Q. We form mainly compact inclusion that are similar to the core. We don't have this radiating periphery. It could also represent an early stage where this is a late, you know, secondary phase of growth uh, in the case of the 72Q. Interestingly, this N17 region was thought to play an important role in membrane interaction. Therefore, we thought if we remove this, it could alter the ultrastructure properties of the aggregates, but actually what we saw is that when we removed the N17, it had no effect in the ultrastructure properties of these, and this sort of core and shell structure is still there. And, not, and so since these cells form both cytoplasmic and nuclear inclusion, we also looked at the structural properties of the inclusions. And what you could see is that these in nuclear inclusions are completely distinct from those ring-like cytoplasmic inclusions, they seem to be made of purely dense accumulation of fibrillar aggregates. We don't see any sequesterization of membrane structures, suggesting that the mechanism of Huntington inclusion is, is in the nucleus could be different from the cytoplasm, and therefore the mechanisms of toxicities associated with each could be different. This is just a large image of these cytoplasmic and nuclear inclusions. So what we think is happening in terms of in, in cells is that you have the aggregation of mutant Huntington, which form these dense accumulation that constitute of fibrils that represent the four, the core of the structure. And then at these aggregates began to grow on the periphery through growth of the fibrils by monomer addition. They began to interact you know, they're much more loosely and they're able to interact with proteins and membrane structures leading to the formation of these complex inclusions that we see. We believe that this first phase is most likely driven by uh, phase separation because as you can see here, it's a very fast process. It's a process, if we transfect these cells and then nothing happened up to 24 hours and then it's a very fast where you see nearly complete depletion of all soluble protein when the inclusions here, uh, you know, uh, form. And what the implications of this is that most, uh, 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 okay, one thing I wanted to say is that if you use a GFP protein, 
this process does not occur. And I'm not going to explain that a lot. Let's talk about this a lot. But what we notice is that if you use GFP fused, uh, Huntington fused to GFP, then the type of aggregates you form are mostly fibrillar in nature, resembling those we see in vitro and do not reconstitute the complexity of inclusion formed by the naked protein. In the Nature Communication paper, we have detailed comparison of proteomics and the toxicity studies, and we can show that these have distinct interactome, proteome composition, and toxicity. Therefore, when you use GFP fused to Huntington, you're able to reproduce Huntington fibril formation, but not Huntington inclusion formation, okay? The implications of, of our work is that most efforts have focused initially in trying to target the early pathway, which is to block the aggregation of Huntington. And what this work and the interaction with these proteins and cellular sequesterization of a lot of functional protein suggests that this growth phase of the nucleation and that nucleation inclusion maturation may constitute an, another important step that can be targeted. So what about nuclear inclusion? And I will I'll finish with the, these couple slides. We tried to study the structure of the nuclear inclusions. We did this in primary neurons. If we express exon one in primary neurons, we can see the formation of inclusions over time. The size of these inclusions tend to increase over time. And basically you can see that this is a, you know, more, more large inclusions forming at day seven and day 14. And in this case, we see a direct correlation between inclusion formation and toxicity. We see an increased toxicity in neurons under condition where these inclusions are formed. So we tried to solve the look at this by electron microscopy. And what you could see here is basically that we can electron microscopy reveal structure that look very similar to what we see of nuclear inclusions in the Huntington brain. They appear to us very fibrillar, but very difficult to decipher. So this is why we did cell tomography with uh, Sergei Nazarov in the lab. And when you do this tomography, you begin to see the fibril architecture. And to make it easy for you to see, this is what Huntington nuclear aggregates look like. You can see that they're made primarily of fibril aggregated form of Huntington. And with this, I'd like to sort of end by emphasizing sort of the, the main messages from the cellular work that is cytoplasmic hunting inclusions are composed of complex mixtures of aggregated mutant hunting in different cellular proteins and membrane organelles, including members of the endosomal system. That nuclear and cytoplasmic inclusion exhibit distinct biochemical composition and ultrastructural properties suggesting different mechanism of aggregation, inclusion formation and toxicity, and that these differences in the cellular environment and interactome could influence the mechanism of aggregation and, and possibly in the, influence their contribution. So we need further, you know, we viewed aggregation at the context of only the formation of fibrils. We need further studies to investigate the role of lipids, organelles, and Huntington interactome prey in the formation of Huntington aggregates and toxicity. We are planning to extend this model to study longer repeat. And there is a hypothesis that was first suggested by Steve Finkenbeiner, suggesting that cytoplasmic and nuclear aggregates could actually serve different mechanisms where the cytoplasmic aggregates more may have more of a protective adaptive response, whereas the nuclear aggregates could be more toxic. With this, I'd like to think, uh, finish by thanking you and acknowledging the people who've done the work. I've sort of mentioned their names. So a lot of the work on the internal fragment was done by Raja and Iman and Anas, uh, Nathan with the help of uh, Anne Lor, and other postdocs in the lab, Niran, Johannes, did a lot of the work on the cellular models. Uh, Dries and, and, Enzo, and Enzo from the lab did all the work with the full length Huntington. And we're grateful for all the help from the bioimaging facility and our collaborators and looking at functional effects of Huntington aggregation and ER stress, Hiso, Farhan and his lab. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a great talk, uh, Hilal. Um, let me quickly go through the questions in the Q&A folder. There are two questions already um, from Guoming. What are the relative populations of different fragments in cells? 
will that vary from patients to patients? Yeah, actually, this is a fantastic question. And the answer is we don't know. We actually, you know, started a project with Richard Fall in, in New Zealand because he has a very nice collection of brain to remap the distribution of Huntington species in different brain regions. And, uh, and this has not been done. This is a big problem, you know. We focused on exon one because of the alternative splicing hypothesis and because it's easy to make. But we know that, for example, 128, 171, 586, all these fragments exist. The relative distribution of these in the pathology is not known. The relative distribution in other in different brain regions is not known. Uh, we hypothesize that that relative distribution could actually partially explain the clinical heterogeneity of the disease. So the answer is we don't know, and we need to know because it's only through knowing that that we can develop the right models to study this disease. Okay, so connected question is: Will a longer fragment be transformed to a shorter one by? Protease during the fibrillation process. Yes. So the answer in, in, in our model system where we start from full length protein, we see sequential uh, fragmentation, you know, even leading to mostly exon one. Now, one thing that could complicate this is in, in this experiment, when we actually look at soluble and insoluble distribution of Huntington over time. This, the longer fragments seem to sediment faster than exon one. In other words, if, the, if you form a longer fragment with higher propensity to aggregate, that process could limit the further processing to generate exon one. Great, thank you. Next question from Martin Mursal. Do you have some insight why the globular domain would promote formation of mesoscopic faces instead of small micelle-like aggregates you showed? It's a very good question, but you know we 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 don't know the answer. We're trying to do more mechanistic work on this. But as I said before, when we studied the sequences within these repeats, we identified multiple stretches that actually between 140, between 110 and 140, there are two eight to nine amino acid stretches that if you synthesize these peptide by themselves, they're very highly aggregation brown. So the idea is that if, if these things, fragments are generated and these domains are somehow exposed, they're as sticky as the poly-Q domain and, and would be sufficient to dry. The, the fact that they don't form fibrils or drive fibril formation directly could be because they're only partially unfolded, you know, that the rest of the protein is still in, in maintain, maintain some helicity. Uh, connected question to that is, do you assume it's micelle micelle aggregation mediated by the poly-Q domain that eventually allows the poly-Q domain to take over and promote fibril formation? We think that's, that's one of the models we're testing, yes. Okay. And the last question is uh, from an anonymous attendee. Does the fibular twist depends on fragment length? Do you see fibular twist for short fragments? Yeah, I didn't have a chance to 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 present this work, but you can see it in the, in the, in the, in our Jack's paper. You know, we we have done the cryo-EM structure of the of the exon one, and the exon. You know, so far none of these fragments seems to form a helical filaments. Uh, most of the Huntington interminal fragments do not form twisted helical. And in the paper, we explain why, because, because you know, there is, there is quite a lot of out of register movement and intra and interfibral heterogeneity in terms of the length of the poly-Q strands and the, helic and, and, the, and the turns. So we, we've only seen the formation of helical filaments with the 586 after we induce phosphorylation. And that's the reason we have not seen a cryo-EM structure of any polyglutamine fragments. And because of their much. ability to go off, off register, it, it, you don't get that uh, twist. Great. Thank you very much for the great talk and the great discussion. So if we can stay around towards the end, we'll get more questions from, from the participants. Let's uh, move on to the next speaker, Dr. Antoine Lockett. Um,
from University of Bordeaux. Antoine received his PhD degree at the University of Lyon in 2009, working with Dr. Anya Brockman on developing solid state NMR spectroscopy for protein structure determination. And then he was a postdoc between 2009 and 2013 at Max Planck Institute, Göttingen, working with uh, Dr. Adam Langa on the uh, solid state NMR application to study protein assembly. <coughs> Since 2014, he is the research director at CNRS and the University of Bordeaux, France. His current research focuses on the structural biology of functional amyloids by solid state NMR spectroscopy. Antoine, it's all yours. Take over. So, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank you and also all the uh, co organizers for this uh, wonderful Zoom uh, seminars. And uh, uh, today I'm going to present uh, three topics. Uh, the first one is related to the methodological development of cell-free synthesis uh, for amyloid uh, uh, proteins. Second topic will be related to the molecular basis of amyloid cross-seeding. And the third topic focuses on the study of uh, heterotypic interface between uh, functional uh, uh, amyloids. But first, uh, I would like to thank the people who uh, contributed to this uh, work. So let me thank uh, all people in uh, the, the group, as well as past uh, members, uh, especially Alonce Lenz, uh, Azen Daskalov, and uh, Jaya Chenoy. And I, uh, I would like to thank also our uh, co-workers, uh, especially uh, the group of uh, Sven Soap, with who we collaborate since uh, now almost uh, 10 years on prions and uh, functional amyloids. So let me start by uh, very rapidly introducing uh, functional amyloids. So we, we all know pathological uh, amyloids since they are involved in various uh, neurodegenerative disorder and they are often associated with misfolding processes and a loss of function uh, mechanisms. Uh, however, the villains can also become the good ones, and uh, amyloids can also be non-pathological, but beneficial for uh, cells. In fact, uh, most of amyloids are actually not pathological, but functional. Uh, indeed, nowadays, it's uh, uh, several thousands of functional amyloids that have been uh, identified. And in uh, 2019, uh, we released a, a special issue in the Journal of Molecular Biology and Functional Amyloids, together with uh, Sven Soap and Diego Romero. And we try to cover a broad range of uh, function or also or, or microorganism associated with this uh, functional amyloids. So uh, in my group, we have a strong interest in functional amyloids involved in various uh, organisms or biological processes. And especially we are interested in amyloids involved in signaling uh, mechanisms. So the long-term objective is to uh, understand why uh, the nature has optimized the amyloid fold to be so efficient in signaling and what could be the advantages of amyloids compared to globular proteins to execute signaling uh, mechanism. Antoine, can you go to the presentation mode? Sorry? Can you go to the presentation mode? Oh, yeah. Yeah, good, this is good. Sorry. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm going to, to, to start with uh, methodological development uh, we have carried out to implement uh, the cell-free synthesis of, of uh, uh, amyloid uh, proteins. And this is just a, a reminder for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, cell-free synthesis. Uh, it's an approach performed in vitro without the requirement of uh, living cells. Uh, in turn, transcription and translation processes are achieved in a mixture composed of uh, cell extract supplemented with uh, amino acids, DNA, uh, energy regenerating system, and so on uh, to achieve the in vitro expression without the, without the cell membrane uh, physical barrier. And uh, this approach can be very powerful for NMR studies uh, because isotopically labeled amino acids can be added to the mixture to obtain a selective uh, labeling. So cell-free approach have been uh, implemented for solid state NMR study during the last decade uh, mostly to study membrane proteins that are uh, uh, especially difficult to express in uh, E. coli. Okay, so actually, why do we want to implement and develop the, the cell-free synthesis of, of amyloid uh, proteins? Well, that's uh, because sample preparation for amyloid proteins is still uh, very challenging 
Uh, as an example, in my group, uh, students spend easily 50% of their research time to perform a sample preparation. Uh, it's time consuming and it's still uh, technically uh, very difficult. And uh, because the production yield are usually low, and this protein also uh, aggregates uh, into inclusion bodies uh, during a recombinant pattern expression. So we need to uh, isolate uh, uh, them from the inclusions and also to solubilize and also to perform additional purification uh, step. And uh, on top of that, also some uh, amyloid domains, especially the small amyloid domain can also be cytotoxic for bacteria. So usually when you, 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 you talk to biochemists about uh, inclusion bodies, they will tell you that they hate inclusion bodies because it means that uh, you need to use uh, biochemical denaturation and also refolding uh, to get you your protein uh, uh, assembly. However, there are uh, one advantage uh, that is associated to the aggregation into inclusion bodies is that actually you can recover quite a lot of, of, of protein. I mean, in terms of quantity of, of protein from these uh, inclusion bodies. Um, so we have implemented the cell-free synthesis for amyloid proteins uh, by adapting protocols uh, developed and based on the dialysis between a feeding mixture and a reaction mixture. So we tested our approach uh, using the prion forming domain of ETS, uh, which is a fungal prion that form amyloid fibrils. And I will come back to the biology of this uh, system later during my uh, presentation. So what was quite surprising for us uh, was the almost spontaneous aggregation of the express protein inside the cell-free mixture. Uh, here what you can see is an electron micrograph of HETES fibrils obtained uh, directly inside the reaction mixture. And we use this uh, biochemical feature, uh, I mean the fact that the, the express protein spontaneously aggregate inside the cell-free reaction to propose a very straightforward protocol uh, for which the pellet uh, obtained in the reaction mixture is simply washed uh, with water, and then we uh, directly use the, this pellet to fill the solid state in the MAR rotor. Um, so um, basically, it means that contrary to, to what we usually do during a recombinant bacterial expression in E. coli, here we do not perform any biochemical denaturation, additional protein purification, or refolding to obtain the uh, fibril uh, sample. And we tested how the approach by implementing a strategic isotope uh, labeling on HETES. So we added uh, unlabeled amino acids and also carbon-13 label, uh, glycine, isolacine, and, uh, and valine. Okay, glycine, isolacine, and valine. And we combined this uh, strategic isotope labeling with the latest solid state NMR technology. So namely the use of fast magic angle spinning to achieve proton detection. So what you can see here are two dimensional uh, solid state NMR experiments. In orange, it's a NH correlation of HETES, prion fibrils, express and purify from E. coli and uniformly carbon-13 label. And in blue, uh, these are the same fibrils, but this time they were cell-free synthesized and selectively labeled on valine, isolacin, and uh, glycine. So comparable chemical shifts are observed and suggesting that the three-dimensional amyloid fold, I mean, at the level of the local conformation is virtually the same between the, the cell-free synthesized amyloids and the fibrils obtained from recombinant expression, denaturation, and in vitro aggregation. Uh, it's, it's unexpected and, and, and I think quite uh, remarkable considering that the cell-free reaction mixture is complex uh, it's not very well controlled and it's also not purified. So compared to the situation uh, in the conventional protocol where we in vitro aggregate uh, HETES from a very pure HETES monomeric uh, solution. So we also observe a comparable spectral resolution. Uh, it also indicates that uh, uh, at the level of the uh, uh, local structural polymorphism, we have a very low structural polymorphism in cell-free synthesized uh, HETES, which is again uh, 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 quite remarkable considering that the aggregation medium is also not controlled and also pretty uh, complex. So we also tested the incorporation of fluorines, uh, uh, so fluorine label, and we could also demonstrate that it's also possible to, to uh, perform um, uh, this labeling of amyloid fibrils uh, using this cell-free uh, approach. So in, in collaboration with the group of 
uh, Gilles Guichard, who recently reported the synthesis of hexafluoroleucines. Uh, we tested the cell-free synthesis of fluorinated uh, amyloids. So HETES has free uh, leucine in its uh, amyloid core. So we could uh, uh, expect uh, six uh, fluorine signal, and actually we could detect five out of six uh, uh, fluorine uh, signals. So this uh, result uh, provides a proof of concept for fluorine, uh, sorry, for cell-free synthesis of fluorinated uh, amyloids with good yield and also with a limited structural uh, uh, polymorphism. Uh, one has also to, to consider that the incorporation of fluorinated amino acid is usually extremely challenging when you work with conventional bacterial uh, expression systems. So that's also a big advantage of, of this cell-free synthesis uh, approach. So the, the, the last test and, and the last experiment, and this one, this one was also very important, was to study the functionality of these cell-free synthesized uh, uh, amyloids. Uh, so, so how uh, synthesized HETES fibrils were uh, able to trigger, to trigger a regulated, uh, regulated cell death reaction in their natural host, which is the fungal podosporan serena. So in, in terms, and to make a long story short, it, it, it indicates that the cell-free synthesized uh, amyloids are infectious, and they also keep their uh, prion uh, properties. And we try to uh, summarize our findings and to put them in perspective compared to previous uh, uh, report. So we observe that uh, self-free synthesized heters from a canonical beta solenoid with a limited structural polymorphism. This is what we, we can see from the NMR uh, uh, line width. And it's something that was uh, observed from recombinant in vivo expression of the same protein in E. coli, uh, followed by denaturation and an in vitro aggregation at pH uh, 7. Uh, uh, the cell-free synthesized amyloids are functional prions, and they are also infectious in their natural host. And this is a feature that was, uh, of course, observed uh, in vivo, but also for fibrils obtained are pH uh, 7. And uh, they have a different behavior compared to the ETS fibrils aggregated uh, in a non-physiological -physi environment at pH uh, 2. So to, to some extent, we, we, we can hypothesize that the complex and the crowded environment that exists in the cell-free uh, rea reaction mixture might also partially reassemble some feature of, of, of the environment for the inclusion bodies. And that's quite interesting because there has been also a report that actually HETES aggregates isolated for inclusion bodies are also infectious. So we think that it, it can also be a good model to study the aggregation in uh, inclusion uh, bodies. Good. Uh, so for the second topic, uh, I'm going to present the investigation of the molecular basis of amyloid cross seeding. Uh, but to start, I would like to introduce uh, signalosomes. So these are intracellular sensors for pathogens, and they control crucial mechanism in uh, immunity. Uh, they are a subfamily of, of uh, what is called uh, the SMOC. These are for supramolecular organizing centers. And they uh, usually share a tripartite architecture with a receptor, a downstream accessory protein, and an executioner that is usually a self-death uh, executioner. And they have been observed in plants, in, in fungi, and also in, in animals. And in fungi, the, the gene architecture can be slightly more complex and involve actually two genes. So one has the receptor, one encode for the receptor and the downstream protein with an amyloid domain that is attached to the, to the enter, while the executioner is located on, on another gene that is adjacent, also with an amyloid domain that is attached to its uh, C-terminal uh, domain. And uh, the last couple of years, uh, we have been working together with the team of uh, Sven Sok on the characterization of a fungal amyloid uh, subfamily of this uh, signalosome that are called HRAM. And in particular, we have focused on one protein that is called HELF. So HELF is a fungal prion that has the ability to trigger self-death reaction upon a templating mechanism that involves uh, its amyloid domain. And we also know actually how to recombinantly express and also to obtain uh, um, uh, uh, beautiful fibrils from uh, uh, health. So we have used this system and tried to see how far we can go with uh, atomic resolution structure determination of amyloid fibrils uh, uh, using the, the latest uh, 
methodology in solid state NMR, so based on magic angle spinning, and also combined with a high field uh, uh, NMR. And we demonstrated that uh, atomic resolution information can be obtained based on a very small quantity. So it's about 200 microgram of recombinant uh, carbon-13 and nitrogen-50 label uh, amyloids. And using uh, solid state NMR uh, structural information, we demonstrate that high resolution structure functional amyloids can be determined uh, using proton-proton restraint uh, uh, in, in, an, in analogy, I mean, it's not exactly the same methodology, but we can make an analogy to structure determination by solution NMR using proton-proton uh, 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 NOEs. So the, 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 the health from a, a, a canonical beta-solenoid structure with two distinct uh, repeats that we call R1 and, and uh, R2. So I'm not going to say too much about the structure since we are mostly interested by the biology of the system more than the structure itself. Although this was a very nice model for us to implement uh, uh, solid state NMR techniques to study amyloid uh, fibrils using proton detection. So we determined the fold of health, uh, which is actually highly comparable to HETES. HETES is another fungal prion for which the structure was also solved uh, uh, in the group of uh, uh, Beat Myers. Uh, and uh, health belongs to the HRAM5 family, while ETS is from the HRAM1 family. Okay. And a very interesting info, uh, observation is that the two sequences uh, only share a 17% sequence homology, while when comparing the structure, they share uh, uh, the same, uh, virtually the same backball amyloid fold. Uh, actually, there's one part that is a bit longer for HETES. Uh, you can see in yellow, that's just because there is an unstructured loop between the two repeat that is uh, longer in the case of uh, HETES compared to uh, HELF. So this is, uh, uh, we believe that this is the experimental demonstration uh, uh, of a very close, uh, not to say identical structural homology of, of sequence distant prion homologues. Uh, especially considering that uh, uh, both prions are actually from the same natural host, so from this uh, filamentous uh, uh, um, fungus. And a, a very interesting experiment, and it, it was highly surprising for us, is the fact that uh, HETES and HELF actually do not cross seed. That's something we have tested in vivo and also uh, in vitro. And so because the two prions are from the same organism and they share the same amyloid structure, and they are both involved in the same uh, uh, regulated cell death reaction, uh, what could actually expect them to be able to cross it, but that was not uh, uh, the case. So in order to explore this aspect of uh, sequence to fold conservation of the beta serenate fold, uh, we have tried to investigate how far we can go with low sequence homology to still maintain a prion behavior and uh, importantly to uh, still keep a structural homology. So uh, we design a, a minimal uh, prion, uh, we call it a head, so for HETES distant prion, and we uh, engineer the sequence of, of head uh, to uh, keep a very low score of homology, so of only 5% uh, compared to HETES. So of course, it's very easy to change amino acids and to go very low in sequence homology. But the point here is to uh, change this amino acid, but to still keep the amyloid behavior and also to still keep the prion functionality. So we uh, managed to do that and actually head. So the, the synthetic head also form a, a prion in vivo when we perform um, solid state NMR to rapidly derive its uh, secondary structure. So it's typically here that uh, I think solid state NMR is a very good technique because we can obtain this information using a minimal amount of spectrometer time and also of uh, spectral uh, analysis. Uh, so we could show that uh, actually because head also has the same uh, structure that the amyloid fold can adapt uh, to an extreme level of amino acid substitution. Uh, in that case, we can even reach the, the so-called midnight zone of sequence homology, which is inferior to, uh, uh, I don't remember, it's 10 or 15 percent of sequence homology. And it's something that was demonstrated a long time ago for globular protein, that you can have structural homology even if you are in the midnight zone of sequence homology. And it's also something that we could show at least 
this example for this class of protein fold, so the amyloid fold. And next, we wanted to see if by uh, actually increasing the sequence homology, we can now bridge the seeding uh, barrier. And for that, we engineer another uh, chimeric prion, we call it uh, HEC, so for uh, HETES close prion. So HEC is a, is a chimeric uh, a prion. Actually, we increase the sequence identity now to 40% compared to HETES. So we change the amino acids to now reach sequence identity of, of 40%. And it was amazing to observe that with this uh, uh, engineered sequence, we could now bridge the seeding barrier and actually uh, cross seed. Uh, uh, so HEC with HETES or with HEALTH independently. And again, we perform a solid state and MR analysis of, of HEC to also show that it keeps the same uh, structural uh, architecture. So uh, it suggests that actually uh, the presence of, of uh, we probably have the presence of a very subtle mechanism that is encoded at the level of the sequence, also at the level of the structure, but not only at the level of, of the structure, I mean, at the level of the three dimensional backbone fold that allow or do not allow uh, uh, the cross-seeding uh, uh, between the prion uh, entities. And that's an aspect we want to explore further uh, uh, in the future by, uh, by engineering uh, more sequences to try to rationalize uh, actually the specificity of this uh, cross-seeding between uh, uh, amyloids. Okay, so for the uh, last part of, of my presentation, I want to focus on the uh, investigation of heterotypic interface in uh, uh, amyloids. And uh, so uh, I go back to this beta solenoid fold uh, uh, that is made by the supramolecular arrangement of two repeats. Uh, these are called R1 and R2. So it's the case in health, but it's also the case in, in, in HETES. And, and as I uh, mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation, there is another amyloid domain uh, that is also encoded by the adjacent gene. So the protein is called uh, NWD2, and to make the story more simple, its, its amyloid domain is called R0, in analogy to R1 and R2 that is present uh, uh, on HETES. And back in 2015, uh, we used specific isotope labeling to investigate the secondary structure of R0 fibrils, uh, but at that time, we didn't manage to get its uh, high resolution structure. Uh, actually, at that time, we use a, a, a peptide syn synthesis to obtain the amyloid domain uh, because it, it, it's, it's a pretty small uh, amyloid domain. So since 2015, we have been working uh, a lot on this, on this uh, system, and we now uh, develop a new strategy, which is based on the design of, of chimeric uh, entity. So in this case, we design a single gene uh, encoding for two prion forming domains called R2 and R2. And, and we incorporated uh, in the sequence uh, an unstructured region between the two amyloid uh, uh, domains. And actually using this, this trick, I mean, that, that's a, a biochemical trick, uh, we could recombinantly express and purify the chimeric R0, R0. And uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, the amyloid fold was quite uh, robust. And this chimeric construct uh, also behave as a prion in the fungal uh, host. And it also gives high quality, very high quality solid state and MR data. Uh, actually, it also demonstrates that this chimeric construct, I mean, the, the way we design it, it didn't induce uh, a local uh, a polymorphism. So we use this, 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 this entity actually to solve the high resolution uh, structure of R0, R0 amyloid fibrils again, using a uh, solid state and MR. So it forms a beta solenoid with a well-defined hydrophobic uh, amyloid core. And so th this, this approach to use a chimeric construct was indeed very efficient for us because uh, we could produce recombinant R0, R0 from a E. coli and also label the protein with carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 isotope. And this would have been very expensive, not to say impossible to do using solid phase synthesis of the short uh, uh, amyloid uh, domain. So the approach was so efficient that uh, uh, we also uh, use it to design a chimeric construct to study at high resolution the heterotypic interface between R0 from NWD2 and the R2 
domain uh, from HETES. So now we produce a, a single protein with a sequence that encode the two amyloid domains. And they, again, we put an unstructured uh, uh, loop between the two uh, domains. Uh, again, he, it was uh, quite, quite fascinating uh, to see that the, this heterotyping chimeric construct also behave as a prion in Podospora uh, uh, and Serbina. And we uh, solve the structure of this R0, R2 uh, construct uh, using solid state NMR. And here there is another uh, um, spectroscopic advantage of, of our approach is that we can actually derive the natural intermolecular interface between R0 and R2. So they, 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 they come from another, from two different proteins. Uh, that's because, and, and that's, uh, let's say, the beauty of this, of this trick. That's, what the, that's because the intermolecular interface is actually derived from the inter, intramolecular interface between the two domains uh, due to this sequence uh, design. So it, it's actually much uh, easier for us uh, uh, to determine uh, intramolecular interface compared to intermolecular interface, because then we would need a much more sophisticated uh, isotope uh, uh, labeling strategy to, to, to do it. So the big picture of, of, of this project is, is to be able to propose a model for amyloid based on plating mechanism. So in this model, NWD2, and so uh, via its amyloid domain R0, would aggregate into beta solenoid and then recruit HETES and establish a, a specific heterotypic interface. So between R0 and R2, and this will trigger the assembly of HETES. So we're able to generate a, a, a high resolution model of the, of the complete uh, 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 fibers. So using the high resolution structure of HETES, the high resolution structure of R0, R0, we solve, and also the HETES NWD2 interface, we also use using a solid state uh, uh, NMR. And, and you can see here this, this structural model of the NWD2 HETES uh, fibrils. And actually, that's an approach we are uh, currently uh, investigating in the context of other functional amyloids, especially functional amyloids found in, in uh, bacteria. OK, so that's what I, I uh, wanted to say uh, to, uh, today. So a few points I want to discuss as a conclusion. So we demonstrate the synthetic synthesis of amyloid proteins for application in NMR-based structural biology. Quite interestingly, we observe that for this system, so for HETES, uh, we have a spontaneous aggregation in the cell-free reaction mixture. So we were able to obtain fi uh, fibrils directly from the mixture without further denaturation or purification. And we show that this approach is very beneficial to introduce strategic isotope labels such as carbon-13 or also uh, fluorines. For the second part, we demonstrate that uh, uh, atomic resolution structure of amyloid fibrils could be derived from proton-proton restraint uh, uh, using fast magic angle uh, spinning. From a structural point of view, we, we established that uh, it is not the amyloid fold per se uh, that prevents the prion strain formation, but rather specific evolved uh, sequence of the prions. And, and actually, that's also why we also designed this head and also this HEC synthetic uh, uh, prions. And we could also show that despite uh, low or very low sequence identity, two prion homologues can adopt the same backbone structure, but surprisingly, they also do not uh, cross seed. And from, a, 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 let's say, a more biological point of view, uh, it suggests that uh, uh, natural prions, because these are natural prions, uh, are evolutionary polished to prevent uh, structural plasticity and strain formation, because this uh, structural polymorphism might compromise the advantage, uh, advantageous uh, seeding barrier. So there must be a subtle mechanism that is encoded at the level of the sequence, also at the level of the three-dimensional fold, but as I say, not only at the level of the three-dimensional fold that will allow or that will not allow the cross-seeding between uh, uh, two prion uh, uh, entities. And for the, the last topic, uh, we develop an approach to get high-resolution structural information uh, 
uh, using solid state NMR uh, to derive the heterotypic interface between two functional uh, amyloid domains. Good, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrein, for the excellent talk. Um, while we are waiting for questions, um, please post your questions in the Q&A folder or raise your hand, we'll uh, enable you to join the panel. So Antoine, in your second topic, uh, proton-based distance constraints, I think, um, and the fast MAS, uh, do you exactly accurately measure the proton-proton distances or you are um, assuming the short, medium, long range distances? Well, actually it, it, it so we, we, what we have done is we use a range. Actually, okay. we, we, we didn't use the intensity. I mean, because we think that was not enough precise. So, you know, in solution NMR, it's possible to make different categories depending the intensity of the NOEs. Uh, here, we actually only use a range. Uh, uh, I don't remember, but it's like from two Armstrong to six Armstrong. I don't remember exactly. Um, I think just because right now it's it's still very difficult to use the intensity of the NMR peaks to derive more precise distance restraint. Yeah, great. Another technical question is in the F19 NMR, the 1D NMR spectrum you showed for isoleucine, I think, uh, CF3, CF3, six fluorines, but you saw five peaks. Do you expect to resolve all the peaks and why is that? Is it frozen or what? Uh, so, I mean, they, they are free lysine in the hydrophobic core, so okay. we also believe that they are rigid. So three times two, it means we we expect to have six peaks. Uh, I think probably due to some issues with the resolution, we think that one peak is actually, I mean, it's just too broad. And then one peak is just in this, in this, uh, in this, in also this, this additional peak is also in this, in this range. I also want to mention that due to technical issue, we have recorded fluorine NMR without proton decoupling, just because on our probe, we can uh, or do fluorine detection or, or proton detection, but we cannot do both. So probably if you apply high power proton decoupling, we should get also better resolution and maybe see the six uh, peaks if they are uh, isolated and if they have different chemical shift. So this is under 60 kilohertz or 100 kilohertz? 60 kilohertz, yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions from the panel? Yes, I have a, can you, can you see me? Yeah. No, no. yeah. We can okay, I have that. just um, a comment for Antoine, an equation for Hilal. The comment for Antoine is that sequence, we know that it is not so strictly related to structure. This is true not only for amyloids, but also for globular proteins. Just to present an example of ubiquitin and sumo, they share only 15% of sequence similarity, but they are over impossible three-dimensional structures. So this is quite, uh, normal in nature. Next, I have a question for Hilal, and my question is, is HTT full length or fragments of the HTT protein a substrate of proteasome? In other words, is it known whether this protein is present as polyubiquitinated forms in inclusion bodies? Actually, you are muted. It is muted. There is, data, there is sufficient data to show that if you inhibit the proteasome, it results in increased accumulation of Huntington. You know, we, and there is um, uh, also data showing that Huntington inclusions are also ubiquitinated. Most of the work that has been done has been usually looking at the degradation of a very specific fragment rather than looking at whether the full length. I mean, there are data, uh, although there are data also shows that if you inhibit the proteasome, you have slight increase of the full length protein. So it's very clear that I think Huntington degradation is regulated by both combination 
of autophagy and the proteasome system. But you know which fragment and which form. This is you know how they're differentially de you know degraded by the proteasome is not clear. Thank you, uh, Hilal. Do these fragments aggregate in the presence of full length protein at all? Yeah, I think this is what we tried to do in this experiment, right? We tried to generate because okay. most of the time they've been studied alone. And yeah, we try yeah. to see if we generate them from the full length under controlled condition, but mimicking what would happen in the cell. Yeah. You know, yeah so yeah. now you have a mixture of full length, we have a mixture of fragment. To be fair, under to be honest, under the condition we're using where the fragment is degraded rapidly. We, you know, so we're actually moving now to try to do this in, in cells with controlled release of the different fragments. And to be, you know, some sort of a spatial and temporal control to be able to to, to validate this hypothesis in a cellular system. But we What's think they do because Huntington, you know, we also think that Huntington in you know the interaction with its natural substrate, you know, binders like HAP40 could influence this process. So it could be that the ones that are not bound to their substrates are the ones that are more susceptible to proteolysis. We don't know because as you saw from the cryom structure, the, 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 that part of the protein remains flexible despite in the complex and with the different polycule, but in the cellular environment, it may still de de develop a different folded structure or you know, interact with different domains or with different protein. That's why I think the right way to test these ideas is now to take this concept into you know cells and neurons and test it. Thank you very much, um, Magda. Do you have any questions? They are muted. Magda, are muted. Uh, I I have only kind of one uh, to Hilal more for clarification. Uh, the the beautiful uh, tomography pictures which you showed of the. Um, inclusions are are they? Uh, can you can you kind of tell us again in what type of cells uh, did you use? So all the, uh, all the images of inclusions, as I showed, the cytoplasm. First, we looked at cytoplasmic and nuclear inclusions in hex cells. Also, oh, it's okay. So, this I have. So the first part was in hex cells, and in hex cells, because we wanted to study inclusions by the same protein in two different compartments in the same cell under the same conditions, right? And so those were actually not tomography. Those data were correlative light electron microscopy. And the okay. technique is usually, you know, you use antibodies or fluorescent labeling to identify a specific cell or a specific inclusion. And then you're okay. able to take that same cell or inclusion and look at it by EM uh, to correlate it. The one where we showed tomography is looking at the hunting, the video is looking at Huntington inclusions in neurons. The last part of the talk was nuclear inclusions in neurons. And I think this is, you know, the, the, the previous images as I showed suggested some sort of a filamentous structure, but they were never very clear. Um, but our data suggests again, that's in the nuclear Huntington, they're predominantly fibrillar aggregates. So, so these neurons, they were um, um, transfected with Huntington? We use oh, one of your fragments. We use lentiviral mediated overexpression of exon one. Okay. All, yeah. the, all yeah. the cellular models I presented were with exon one Huntington. All right, okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, that's really helpful. Yeah, it's a beautiful data. It's really nice to see everything put together because we as a biochemists always like to uh, just look at the things one at a time. And right now, when you put up everything, you can get more insights in what is actually going on. Yeah, I think the complexity in terms of you know the different fragment is, is something that is not unique to Huntington because when Huntington, we think of different fragments. When it comes to other protein, you also have a mixture of different truncated forms. You know, truncation is a common modification for tau, synuclein, and PTMs. So the idea yeah. that uh, you know it's a, it's a one protein, one mechanism of aggregation is probably not the case. Uh, 
I think that's, uh, you know, you know, how do we deal with, you know, modeling and understanding the, the complex interaction and aggregation of multiple homologs at the same time? You know, I think yeah. this is something we're going to have to 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 learn how to model and study, increase the complexity beyond sort of one disease, one protein, one mechanism. I think the second implications of our work is that, you know, although the first step of going from from monomer to fibrils is driven, you know, is is like can be likely reproduced in cells. It is clear now that what we produce in cells is different, in, in, sorry, from E. coli proteins is different from what's in the brain. Because all the cryogenic structures of, of amyloid proteins isolated from the brain have very different structures from those we form in, from recombinant protein. And a lot of this has to do with two things, post translational modifications and the complex environment where this aggregation process begins to happen. So what this means is we need to, to begin to take these complex systems and understand the grammar of aggregation again so that we can refine our in vitro model systems you know, to be able to, you know, to replicate the structures that we see. I think the final point is maybe I want to emphasize again, there is much more to pathological aggregate than just the fibrils. You know, the fibrils is just the first part of the process. And if you review our work at Lewy bodies, you can see there where we can, we can see that these fibril structures are not end products. They, a lot of the PTMs we actually see in pathology happen after fibril formation. And they get significant remodeling and they interact with other cellular components a little bit to form the inclusion. So the inclusions is, is a complex mixture of the aggregate plus the, everything, you know, many other things that are in the cell. And I think if we began to study aggregation in this, in terms of a process, not individual entities, we can begin to explain a lot of the discrepancies that we see between what we observe in vitro and what's in the human brain. Yeah, I, I entirely agree with you. Um, but but this is of course quite challenging to account for all the components and stuff. But it's it's the way the thing should. Uh, I I always say that the answer is you know by embracing complexity. You know we yeah. saw from Antoine's work in terms of cell-free system of generation of proteins. Our lab has been at the forefront of showing you know chemical synthesis of proteins where we can reproduce the entire proteoform of cytonuclein, every single form that exists in the brain, blood, and CSF. Uh, you know, we now have cellular models that allow us to see this complexity. So I think it, it is complex, but if we begin to embrace and approach that complexity, it's tractable. The yeah. other option is to stay doing what's simple, but it's not tractable. It's you know doesn't recapture yeah, this process. Yeah, so yeah, I, think, I yeah. Yeah, the way I see it is we need to tack, deconstruct this complexity, learn from it, and go back and improve the sort of our simple systems to be more relevant to to the biological process. Because yeah. ultimately, we need these cell-free systems to understand things at the structure and sequence level. There are a lot of and even. You know, there are a lot of things we cannot do in cells, we cannot do in vivo, but we need to bring these in vitro systems to, to be closer to what's happening in the brain in, this case, in case of these diseases. And I think it will be possible. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's really a great idea. It's, yeah, thank you. So there are no other questions. Uh, thank you both very much for great talks and great discussion. I really appreciate taking time out. I think there was a question out. for uh, Antoine. Oh, there's one question here. Okay. Aphrodite. Uh, from uh, Ada. Uh, Ada uh, a question to Antoine. Which are the earliest interaction mediating cross seeding with your chimeric constructs? You are muted, Antoine. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I say it's, it's a very good question. Um, I'm not able to answer just because we look at the final state 
which is the cross-seeded amyloids. Uh, um, when you know you already have a, a huge network of hydrogen bonds, so I mean, we we I'm, I'm sorry, state NMA is not the technique to answer this to respond to this question because we look at the final product that is already well formed. So uh, we cannot say what are the key residue that maybe start to, to, to interact together before forming this very stable uh, interface. I guess molecular modeling might maybe help to, 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 to be able to, to analyze what are the first step of this, of this event. All right. So with that, uh, thank you both very much. Thank and you for having us.